get my name, get your name. Get the get the the crack of the. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another author event at the Poison Pen Bookstore. I'm John Charles, and today we're delighted to have with us three of our favorite authors: Paige Shelton, the star of the day, and her sidekicks Jen McKinley and Kate Carlisle. Um, <laughs> If you're new to the Poison Pen, welcome. Um, we encourage you to sign up for the bookstore's e-newsletter. It lets you know who's coming to the store, what books we have coming in. It's real easy to do on your way out. Stop up front, they can get you connected. Virtual people tuning in, we do have copies of all of our author's books today that are signed while supplies last. So if you'd like one, either give us a call or go online to the Poison Pen Bookstore. We can connect you with some fabulous holiday reading. Now I'd like to welcome Paige, Kate, and Jen. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. <laughs> We're going to start with you, Paige, because your new book is the most recent, Lost Hours. Thank you. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the book. It is book five in a series that is set in Alaska. The premise being that the main character, Beth, was um, kidnapped from her home in St. Louis. She escaped the van she was being kept in, ended up in the hospital. The kidnapper got away, so she was scared. So she checked herself out of the hospital and escaped in, to Alaska to hide in a small area um, that's based on Gustavus, Alaska. If you're familiar with Gustavus at all, it's a, it's a Benedict. It's near the Glacier Bay National Park. It's as small as it can get, no internet, nothing. Um, and so she's up there. And as she's up there, she's healing, she's dealing with her demons, but she's also helping solve murders because, you know, there's got to be a lot of murders. Um, uh, so this is book five in this series. The arc throughout, the story arc throughout the series is the kidnapper if they find him, if they arrest him, um, what happens to him via other people, uh, as well as the main mysteries that go along with each story. But just for those listening in, you can read each book by itself. Yes, yes, you can. Okay. Each book by itself. And I try not to do a lot of backstory in each book, but each book will tell you what happened to her and how she got to where she is. My next question for you is, why Alaska? Did you just want to write off a trip? Well, actually, no, that was for my Scotland series. I really wanted to write off a trip, so that's why I did that one. But the Alaska book was because I needed someplace primitive. My husband and I had gone there for our honeymoon decades ago, and it was so primitive, it struck me that you could be, it's more out in the middle of nowhere, even when you're in the middle of population. It's still stark and there's a lot of open space. And then we went up to Juneau a couple of years ago and it hasn't changed that much. It's not like the spread um, that you're seeing in all the cities down in the lower 48. It is absolutely still a lot of open space. 30,000 people. Are you ready for this? 30,000 people have gone missing in Alaska. <laughs> I know. I know it's shocking. So there's a lot of opportunity for no internet, no cell phone. There's a lot of opportunity for just having to solve a crime and not calling for help. And so that's what I was looking for when, um, when I was looking for a place to set it. Is it also because it's easy to disappear up there if you're a criminal? Very easy. It's e it, you know it's getting easier and easier to disappear anywhere. But in Alaska, there's nothing shocking at all about someone who lives in a dugout, in the middle of nowhere, who digs out a home, who covers it with uh, uh, yeah yeah cover it with anything and makes a home out there and lives off the grid. It's fine. They're just left alone. Oh, cool. That's you know that's Phil. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's our buddy. He comes into town every once in a while. So you can kind of be whatever you want. And in these in these smaller communities in particular, you're very accepted. It's very much part of life. Mm -hmm. Now, your character, Beth, is a writer. Yes. Have you ever found yourself borrowing little incidents from your own life to give Beth's character? You know, Beth, Beth's mom, <laughs> I've met a few crazy people in, in, in my life, and Beth's mom is absolutely insane. She's a narcissist. And so I have used this 
to work through this particular part of my personality and learning how, um, you know, toxic narcissism can work and how, how there's really sometimes no getting away for it. And you just have to find your own path in, in this, this rough time. And I've actually used that to work with it. As far as her being a thriller writer, I haven't, in fact, when I talk about her books, I love going dark because I love talking about someone being, you know, in a building that has 37 floors and she's terrorized all night long. And that's one of the thriller books that Beth wrote. I could never write that, but boy, that sounds like fun, doesn't that? Doesn't that sound great to be able to read a book that kept through a whole book in one building for 37 floors? This woman is terrorized. Oh, that would be fabulous. Somebody needs to write that. Yeah. It would be a different kind of cozy. Yes, yes, true, yeah. true, <laughs> true. Um, well, it looks like Jen sat still for 10 minutes, so yes. we might want to give her an opportunity. Jen, can you... Can, it won't last much longer. Yeah. Can you tell us about your holiday book, Sugar Plum po Poisoned? Uh, I don't remember a number of... I don't know. 47. Think we'll go with that. Yeah. Oh, and I was thinking 37 floors. Isn't that Die Hard? Kind of. How appropriate. Right. The best Christmas movie. Christmas movie. So, yeah. yeah. Sam, you were on point. Good. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, Sugar Plum Poison is the cupcake bakery. And uh, if I remember right, talking about stealing from your life, the lead in the in that is, um, you know, not the bakers, but the, the person who has the murder associated with them is a singer. And my husband is because as someone pointed out, I had video of my husband singing last night. So, <laughs> so and by I do the way, plunder he my was life. on point last night. We were all at this man. He can play the guitar. Like no one I've seen live and in person. So awesome. Anyway, bye. no, he's very good. He's at a wine festival in Phoenix. <laughs> so if you want to see me and then go see him. <laughs> um, so I, you do use your own life. I think, I think we all do, you know, and it's, it can be a tiny thing. Like I can have just overhear a conversation and somebody says something and then I'm like murder, you know? <laughs> so that's fun. Um, I don't know what that says about us. But it's, I, I, I don't know. I love writing the Cupcake Bakery Mysteries. They're my friends. Um, I've hit points in my life that have been a struggle, like the pandemic. I think everybody was like, what is happening? And I had to write the Cupcake Bakery. And I, I thought, I can't do it. The world's on fire. You know, I, I'm just so sad. And then it was like, I think I'm a reader. And when I open a book, I escape into a story because the world's on fire. <laughs> but when you're a writer, it's the same thing. And especially if you've been in a series for a long time, um, I'm with family and friends and, and I care about the seven brothers and I care about Mel and Angie and I care about, you know, them solving the murder. So Sugar Plum Poison was the first really Christmas one I wrote. And that was super fun because Christmas and murder. <laughs> uh -oh. Kate, what about you? What is the question? I'm sorry. Tell us, tell us about your new book, The Twelve Books of Christmas. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I was somewhere in <laughs> cupcake <laughs> land. Um, the book is uh, The Twelve Books of Christmas, and it's a bibliophile mystery. And in that book, Brooklyn and Derek, uh, who's a former you know, MI6 secret agent, and that's my reality right there. That's it. That's where I live. Um, and they go to Scotland. They have friends in Scotland that they visited in the book, uh, previous book, and they live in a castle, and um, they're getting married, and they uh, ask Brooklyn and Derek to come and be uh, their <sighs> maid of honor. And It's not that. It's, you know, just there. What do they call them? Witnesses. I'm thinking maid of honor? No. Mm -mm. Um, so they go to Scotland and this time because it's Christmas, they feel bad about going to Scotland and not be with their mom and dad. And uh, their friends, Claire and the Lord, the Laird, um, invite mom and dad along because they've met them and so that would make more of a fun story with mom and dad and everybody, the whole gang. Um, so uh, they go to the castle and in the castle, there was a library. And the first time there was there, um, they were there was um, Brooklyn found the library and it was hideous and it's been 
dust filled and she wanted to just take over the library and take care of it, but she couldn't stay long. But so this time she comes back and there's a new librarian who's uh, a little suspicious. She keeps the door locked and they don't know what's going on and a few books have missing, go missing. And uh, so the, they got to find a book and then they find a killer and they find it. So anyway, that's how it goes. <laughs> That's what it's all about. They're both extraordinary Christmas books, by the way. They're fabulous, even with the murder. <laughs> My next question is for all of you, but we'll start with you, Paige, because you're the guest of honor. You've all written series. What is the key to a successful series? Do you always know when to end it? No, you don't always know when to end it. I'll answer backwards, but no, you don't always know. I think you have to rely upon, um, I, I mean, sometimes publishers choose to end it. That's their choice. That's their decision. But as a writer, sometimes you want to let go too soon. Sometimes you want to let go too late. So it, it's sometimes hard to gauge. That's why if you're lucky, you have a couple of people in your in your squad, so to speak, that can say, oh, maybe, maybe not, you know, that that can help you along that way. As far as writing this series, I'm going to take, this is something I learned from Jen because she looked it up. It's, it's nice because readers like a certain, certain elements of your series that you need to make sure you bring to every series. Jen calls it the butter. The butter. So the butter. The butter. Yeah, so it's the butter. So you bring the certain characters, you bring the certain um, elements of romance, you bring the quirkiness of some characters, you bring the locations, and, and readers of series tend to love some of the sameness in each book. They want a new story each book. But as my editor once told me, if in my Scottish book, if I don't bring in Tom, she's like, what's the point of reading? That's, that's, my, that's my main character's husband. And she's like, I want Tom in a kilt in every book. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. See, so, so that's kind of the, as Jen said, the butter. So that's part of the, um, what, did I answer that? Uh, when does the series end? What are the key ingredients? Oh, those were the key ingredients, keeping the quirkiness of the characters, the familiarity of the characters. Some of the locations have to stay the same. And in my case, in, in, in my other series, a kilt. In, in the Alaska books, probably some wildlife activity because it's dangerous up there. And as I was told when I went up to Juneau and I said, so what wildlife is here? And she, um, I was told all of it. And so that's what Beth is told. So I try to bring in some wildlife to each, you know, a, a dangerous situation in each one. Good. Now I'll go to Jen and Kate. Okay. Um, the butter I got from an author named Theodora Taylor. Okay. Right. And I want to abscond with her. It's, she wrote a really good book called um, Seven Figure Fiction. So if you're a writer, or you're interested. And it's a lot of common sense, but, you know, I've been in the game a long time and it was stuff I needed to hear. Like, you know, because sometimes the editor, my lovely editor, who I adore, will be like, we need more recipes. And I'll be like, I don't want to. <laughs> it's hard. You know, I'm not really a cook. I, I bake. But um, but it's kind of the readers look forward to them. And, and they actually bake them, which is shocking to me because um, it is work. <laughs> but but uh, I think Paige nailed it. I think every series has a, a strength, whether it's an ensemble cast or families that you get attached to. And I think... A series, for me, re, as a reader, a series ends when there's no more change. Like, I think we've all found series that we liked, but then we realized 10 books in, we were reading the exact same book. Like, the characters just really didn't grow. And for me, that's when a series ends. It may not end for the author, <laughs> but it ends for me. And so for, I actively try to keep growth as, like, they get married, they have kids, you know, or, or they can't, or, you know, whatever. Like, real life stuff like we all have, but then have the mystery still be the whatever. It ends. <laughs> That's really when it ends is when you get a phone call and say, we, we need to look at something else. Yeah. Um, for me in a series for, for reading, it's all about the characters and, you know, it's gotta be a mystery and all that sort of thing. But, um, I go to the reg the, the latest book to see um, what's happening with so-and-so in a series. I mean, it used to be, I used to read a lot of um, 
Stephanie Plum. Yeah. yeah. That's it. <laughs> Stephanie Plum. And you got every book and now you're in, you know, 430 series. Um, and you want to know what's happening with grandma. You want to know what's happening with Lola. You, the hamster's still alive. The hamster still alive. I think, unfortunately, she probably is still alive. I think so. Oldest hamster. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and you have to remember that when you're writing because uh, I move, I've taken my characters out of their home and moved them to Scotland for a book. And you have to bring everyone <laughs> with her, so mom and dad, and I mean, you have to bring the heart of the series with you so that readers don't just shake their head going, what? It's a mystery and that's fun, but where is the butter? Yeah, where's the butter? So, um, so it's community and if you're staying in the community, it's, it's something new happening. For my books, um, I write a book binder uh, mystery and she is always working on a book. So with every book that I write, my character Brooklyn is working on um, usually a famous book or a classic or something that she's been given to work on. And that provides the, the catalyst for the mystery and the the suspects, sus <laughs> suspects, and the and the killer, and everything revolves around that book. So that's um, that's what I always concentrate on. The fixer upper is all about fixing up buildings and houses and everything. And it's that's what the readers come back for. I think it's the community more than anything else. What was the book, Kate, in 12 Books of Christmas? You've got 12 in the title, but was there a particular book? Oh, that is so rude of you <laughs> to ask me. Um, you know, I, I looked up... Jen told me to ask you. She is... <laughs> she's such a friend. Um, I have... I looked up Christmas books, and do you know, there's hundreds of little thin little Christmas books and kids' books, and they're all great and all, but as far as... Christmas books that are classics or it was really hard to find 12 of them <laughs> but there are they're out there and I got them all in the book in my book but a Christmas Carol of course and um a child's Christmas in wherever it was thank you <laughs> my mind is so empty right now we've been plotting all weekend and I'm in three books there's a list down. at the back of the book no. There's a list somewhere in there, yes. And some of the books are, you've never heard of them. And like there's one book that I'd never heard of, and it turns out that that was the basis for, um, geez. Miracle on 34th Street? No, it's the one where he <laughs> runs through the snow. <laughs> yes. It's yeah. a wonderful life. It's based on this short story. And it's, and, I had to find the rarest version of it because she's a bookbinder, so she's going to deal with the book. So um, I'll find the list <laughs> and get back to you. But there aren't a whole lot. And some of them were um, like Dr. Seuss and the, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and uh, which is not a classic British story, but they have it there. And it is a classic story. Classic yeah, and the story, first edition so. is pretty valuable. Yeah, for sure. So anyway, I'll get the list for you. Okay. okay. <laughs> Let's talk about your writing process because I know you're all over the map, your little group up here. Start with you, Paige. When you approach a book, I'm guessing because as a reader, I think you have to know who did it because you have to hide the clues. You have to have multiple suspects, but I've been proven wrong. Wouldn't it be nice to know everything or anything, frankly? So I'm fortunate to do this plot group, and I'm a pantster, meaning I just kind of write by the seat of my pants. But what I look for in my plot group is a seed of something. So um, I'm trying to think of the latest seed we planted, uh, but it was a seed and we didn't have the book, but I can't see. And I was just telling Kate this on the way here, I'd give anything to see a book from scene to scene, to be able to see the first one, the second chapter, the third chapter. 
I can't do it. But when I talk with these guys, I can see their books more than I can see my own. So my method is more pantster by the seat of my pants. And I just kind of write and see what happens, which means I do a lot more editing in the second draft than than they do. But um, that's the only way I can do it. I wish I could. I wish I could see more. But fortunately, I have a couple of people who can and they give me some wonderful guidance. <laughs> And then I think I'm in the middle because I do a, a outline, you know, it can be one, 10, whatever pages. Um, so when I am writing, I know the person has to be murdered, but I might not know how they're going to get murdered. So that's still interesting for me, you know, um, and then you're a little bit more. I think, yes, you'd, you'd think that's how I was. I, I, I've sort of lost my will to live. I sort of. <laughs> I start with a serious plot and I plot with these guys and they're really save my life each time. But also I plot the way I start with the book is I start with the book that she's going to work on. And that book, whatever it is, um, gives me the whole story. Really. It's a, it's going to be a usually classic because it's going to be expensive and rare. Um, because it has to be stolen or, you know, worried over and things like this. But um, it also provides the, um, the suspects and the mystery and the, um, you know, the victim. And, uh, and there's an example in each of my books and it's always different. And my head aches with the whole idea. Um, the last one with the 12 books of Christmas, um, it was a little trickier because it wasn't really about the books. There was one book that was very expensive and, you know, they were all lost. But it was about what happened to the books and how they found them. And um, it, it was kind of a, a departure from what I usually do. I mean, I usually do something like Oliver Twist. And with Oliver Twist, I invented a a festival at a book binding studio called Twisted. <laughs> and the book was a rare version of Oliver Twist and it it just provided everything. The 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 person who was going to die, the reason why she died, the twist twisted was the festival and it just went from there. So that's usually how, how I end up plotting. I used to be really, really good at this. And now I just have 12 books and I'm like, what? What am I doing? And I blame them because they're my plot people. But anyway, that's how I do it. It broke you. <laughs> my next question for you is, what is the best piece of advice about writing you've been given? Write the book of your heart. I mean, that's a very cliche, but if you don't love what you're writing, it's not going to be good. If you're writing and you have a sense of something's wrong here, but you keep writing, that's wrong. Figure out what's wrong and go back and, and redo and fix. So while I say write the book of your heart, it's not necessarily the book you love, but when you're writing, use your intuition to guide the way because it will tell you if something's off and if something's on, it will be cheering for you. It will be like, mm -mm, no, can't do that. And if you don't listen to it, you will, or I will, I have come to regret it. So I listen to it every time. See, Paige has so much better advice than I do because I am like, <laughs> book of the heart, what? I don't have time for that. Um, the best <laughs> advice, and I'm serious about this, that I ever got was for um, to write fast because I started out later than <laughs> some people and I, I wanted to catch up. So the first year that I published a book I wrote four books and it went from there for a while and that that wore me down and um but I was writing fast for a long time I don't I don't write quite as fast these days but I still when I'm writing I write really fast because I'm usually behind schedule and so that's sad but um 
that was the best advice, really. Um, good. They pretty much covered it. I think I always, I love talking to other writers when they, and they tell the story of like when they committed to being a writer. And I had one, a friend, Dolores Fawson, and I remember she told me that she said she met a, a big author, you know, she knew she wanted to be an author and you know, she's busy raising kids. She was in the military, big full life. And she, but she met this like author that she just revered. So, um, she said, you know, she did the typical, cause I've been, the, I've been in the, this seat where you're not published and you meet someone who's published and it's what you think you want. No, I'm <laughs> um, and she said, you know, I I'm going to write a book someday. And the author just looked at her and she said, where is someday on your calendar? And she was just like, oh, <laughs> and, and she went home and started writing. And it was like, so my advice is, you know, it's, you hate to be like Nike, but you know, butt in the chair, get it done, get her done, you know? We usually get a lot of questions from people to authors about how involved they are once the book is done in terms of creating the cover, creating titles. Cre if your book is an audio, do you have input into that? So talk a little bit about your relationship with your publisher editor in terms of how much you provide to them. And remember, they could be listening. It's true. <laughs> That's very true. I'm very fortunate. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I am fortunate. I have an amazing editor and part of, I also have an amazing agent and part of negotiating some of this Alaska series was um, we get to have some approval, some disapproval of the covers. And amazingly, we haven't had one moment where we've been like, no, 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 we don't like that cover. But my editor is always good. Are you sure? This is this is good. This is you see anything ask for it. So I've been very lucky. But I've also had books in the past where I had zero input whatsoever. So as far as the cover goes, um, as far as the process goes, you uh, you know you give a book and then they send you back revisions. You revise. You send it back in. They send you back copy edits so you get a chance to go through and do big editing things. You send it back in and they send it back to you one more time for the final edits where maybe little spaces were were left in too many spaces, too many you know bad punctuation or something like that. So there is a lot of back and forth. And even after that, proofreaders read and then. I have the opportunity to fix things that way as well. So as far as my input on covers, I really, I'm not artistic. I don't have a visual at all. So there's not much I can say, but I've been very fortunate in that I've been able to on this Alaska one say, thumbs up, let's go for it. Let's do it. And that doesn't always happen. So I feel very lucky. Um, as far as the input for anything else, it's, it's, thankfully we have editors out there. I mean, Everybody needs an editor. I need about 12, but that's okay. I'll jump. You want me to go? You want me to go? Rock, paper, scissors. Um, I think for me, it's pretty simple. I'm very fortunate. Uh, the art department is amazing for uh, Penguin Random Houses Berkeley. And I haven't had a bad cover, and I'm like in 55 books now. So good job, guys. <laughs> um, but for me, it works out. They'll, I'll write the book and then like a year, six months, a year in there somewhere, they'll say, what do you, what's your vision for the cover? And what I do is just, um, like I have, uh, the next cupcake comes out. It's, uh, two football players by a franchise. So I knew I wanted like a football theme and the cover, they just sent me the cut and it's awesome. <laughs> it's like a cake and it was like, yummy. anyway, um, so I'll send a couple of pictures. Like I sent cupcakes with footballs on them and I knew I wanted it green, you know, cause the field football. And then they send back this sketch usually. And then if I have any issues, they'll be like any problems. And I'm always like, no, cause you're amazing. And then they come back with the color cover and I'm just like, yes. So, I mean, I think we're pretty lucky. And then for, you know, page covered the turning it in, revisions, copy editing. Audio is pretty cool because especially with, um, not so much with the mysteries, probably because they've been long running series. So we haven't had to have a new narrator. Um, but for the rom-coms that I write, they will, we always have a producer and then the producer will reach out and they say, okay, I have these three narrators in mind. Here are their sound bites. Listen to them. And I've been really lucky because I'll hear, you know, each of them. And then one of them is just the voice. They're the character. And I'll say that one. And they're like, okay, we hope they're not booked. So then you kind of sweat it. And then I've been really lucky. Everyone I've picked has been chosen. So really happy. 
Um, my uh, guy who designs my covers is Daniel Craig. That's his name. Oh, the said. movie star. <laughs> That's his name. Hi. I'm very lucky. <laughs> He's got a little side hustle, right? Um, but he designs the bibliophile mysteries and. I feel like I have a lot of input. I mean, I send 27,000 pictures and uh, samples. And the, I mean, the first time she got a cat, I sent like 15, seven, you know, poses for the cat. And it was great. And this this guy is wonderful. Um, and depending on where she is, if it's a, there's always books. Even her wedding book was, there were books. It was all white and Pretty and a cake and anyway, um, this one, uh, I, I, when I saw this cover, I just went, I, it just blows my mind when I see these things. I send them so many ideas, and he comes back with this. It was just gorgeous, and I was so happy I made a, an ornament out of that. It's so <laughs> cute and pretty. Anyway, I love my artists. I, I always and I have a lot of input. But no matter how much input I have, I'm not a designer or an artist. So I'm always really thrilled when I see the covers because they've always been great. I will say, and I don't, I mean, I've never sent in pictures. I think that's fascinating. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Should I be doing that? <laughs> so I, I haven't done any of that. But I will, if you look at this font, and this is on all the books, the artist who designed the covers made up this font just for this series, which I think that's so cool. And I'm like, man, I'm special, <laughs> you know, but, but I'm going to start sitting in pictures too. I like this. Is that the Shelton font? <laughs> yeah. We're going to call it the Shelton font. I like that. that works. Well, it's kind of apropos because you did write a, a series about typefaces. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, Pete, or not Paige, Jen, you've had a little bit of a different experience with publishing because you've published some of your own books. Has that made you drunk with power? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it wasn't that. It was probably the other things. But yeah. yeah, just drunk. No. <laughs> That's the work that makes you drunk. No, um, yeah, it's self so I wrote two rom-coms, and then there was kind of a holding period, which I, you know, they never really tell you what's going on. You kind of have to suss it out but um it was you know waiting to see how i would do you know would they buy more would they not could i do this could i not that's fun <laughs> and yeah very patient i can can you tell um so i kind of knew there was going to be a gap so i thought well in this market which is very fast you don't want to lose that visibility because i knew it would be like you know a year or so so and i write out of spite so I thought I would do an audio book thing. So I wrote up some ideas and we sent it into the audio people who were actively looking and they were like, oh, these are fantastic. Your numbers are terrible. We're not going to do it. Dark Gen Rising. Um, <laughs> so I decided to write them anyway. And then I was publishing them and my, <laughs> I have the best agent ever, called me and went, um, what's this? <laughs> I said, well, I, I wrote out a spite. <laughs> And she said, well, would you like me to sell the audio? And I went, oh, th you can do that? Writer, idiot. Um, and she said, yes, yes, we can do that. <laughs> so they went to auction. And we got Which a, is a good thing. Yeah, that means everybody crazy. wants them and is competing, sending in competing bids. So, so, you know, the original one that made me feel spiteful, you know, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just saying, if you need a motivator writing out of spite, you know, <laughs> just saying it's good. But anyway, so that journey was, I wrote these three novellas and I set them in a museum of literature that I made up and I put in New York City and they're just happy rom-coms, hundred pages each, short, happy. One is set at Christmas. It's called It Happened One Christmas Eve, which was inspired by the It Happened One Night movie, the classic. And I just had a lot of fun, but I've been in the game long enough that you don't put out something without it being professionally edited. And I'm not an editor. So I hired somebody. And then I have other writer friends who've done a little bit of self-publishing. And I was like, well, I really want to have my brand, the look that I have in my rom-coms, carried over to these novellas. So they hooked me up with a brilliant artist, Llewellyn Designs, and... 
and I did this the same thing. I was like, well, I want a woman in a gown because she's at a gown when she runs away from the guy she's supposed to marry. And then he's dressed as Santa. So I like cut and pasted these like really bad clip art, you know, <laughs> things. And then she came back with these covers and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Like it was like so much beyond what I expected. So it's, if you are gonna self publish to me, it's worth it because it's you and it's your brand, put the money in. You know, if, if you don't have the patience to go the traditional route or if they just don't get you because traditional publishers miss a lot. I mean, there's a lot of people, I always think of Confederacy of Dunces. I mean, he ended up winning the Pulitzer posthumously. It's a brilliant book, and he was rejected by everybody. And But his mom took it to a professor and went, is this any good? And the guy was like, oh, my God. You know? So sometimes traditional publishing is not going to get your vibe. So get out there and do it yourself. <laughs> and I am drunk with power now. <laughs> Since it's the holiday season, my next question for you is, what books would you give as gifts to the readers in your life? Well, that's a great question. Of course, first of all, <laughs> yeah. 12 Books of Christmas and Sugar Plum Poisoned are perfect gifts for Christmas. Perfect, perfect. But other books that might be around here that I've really enjoyed that John actually recommended to me. Um, there's one called the, uh, help me, the Mother Daughter. Mother Daughter Murder Night. It's fabulous. Mother it's Daughter fabulous. Murder Night. That's one. And then the Socialites Guide to, to Murder. You go so Socialites Guide to Murder is also another one. I think I'm finding a theme that I'm really enjoying lately. <laughs> but absolutely, they would make great gifts for anyone, but particularly this one and this one. And the one in the middle. <laughs> the last hour. I mean, who doesn't want to spend Christmas in Alaska, right? Yeah. Okay, Jen. Are you ready? You're not ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. John luckily found a copy. This is one of the my most fun books that I read last year. Um, it's called A Novel Disguise. It's Samantha Larson. And it's essentially a, uh, well, let me just read the back. 1784, London. Miss Tiffany Woodall didn't murder her half-brother, but she did bury him in the back garden. <laughs> Do you get the vibe? This was, it was clever. It was a great mystery. I loved the character. And um, I think what I loved most about it, she ends up dressing as her half brother because she is a 40 something woman in 1784. Um, she does, I, no spoilers, but anyway, she's a good person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a reason she buried him. But it was the kind of thing as a woman at that time, she was living in his house. And if he did not exist, she was homeless. But she takes it one step further and ends up a novel disguise, becoming him and being the librarian to the Earl that he was. And it's just, it's like, it's, I mean, it's not like it's women's rights, but it's women's rights. <laughs> it's like, we've worked really hard to get where we are. Don't pretend we didn't. But it's a great mystery. It's, um, it was just fun. And it's 1784 and we do a lot of historicals, but we don't do a lot. It was so perfect because they wore so much padding. The men wore heels. They wore white face paint. They had the little beauty marks. I mean, you really could, like it was conceived, like it was possible that she could do this, which I loved. So anyway, and hopefully she's writing more because it was really good. So get that one. I'm trying to find the book in the... Do you remember the title? Thank you. Okay, I saw this book and I haven't even seen it in my hands. So I don't know if you have it. That would be a bonus point mm -hmm. for me. Okay. Um, it's called Bibliophile. And I just saw it. And it, it's beautiful cover. It's like this red, it looks like a Christmas present. Um, and the story, I, I was trying to find it because the story is amazing and I can't remember the whole thing because I only zoomed through it real quick. Um, but it's two sisters in World War II who are bibliophiles. They work in a book binding, you know, uh, store or shop or business. And they each have a different, it feels like, and I'm seriously cannot remember the whole thing that I read, which is why I was <laughs> looking for it. Um, but one of them has an artistic sense and the other one has a, a, business, a sense. business sense. And um, it's World War II and it, it just looked fascinating. And it's beautiful. I mean, it looks like it's a Christmas present that you should buy after you buy all of these. <laughs> anyway, I recommend it. I hope it's good. 
Kate, in some ways you remind me of people who came into the library and said the book had a green cover. <laughs> Tell me what it thank you. Well, I'm just pathetic. Which, by the way, I have done that with John, and he's nailed the book immediately. <laughs> so he, he are, he's a book talker. <laughs> okay, before we go to questions from your many millions of fans, tell us what's next, if you'd like, from you as an author, Paige. Okay, absolutely. So the next Scottish bookshop comes out in April, and it is called The Poison Pen. <laughs> It, it looks like I might be coming here in May, so um, so uh, put that on your calendar. That should be fun. And uh, then the next Alaska book publishes next December. And I do have a title. They haven't put the cover out, but they have sent me the cover, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you anyway. It's called Perfect Storm. And a lot of killing might be happening in that one. <laughs> Um, coming next, uh, right now, uh, it's the next fixer upper mystery and it has a title and everything. The title is, um, oh, the, the, uh, the knife before Christmas, sorry. The knife is actually a drywall knife. Um, of course. And it's a Christmas book. And, uh, so it's coming out next Christmassy time, October probably. And um, so we'll be doing this again. This we'll be doing this again, and I'll try to get my stuff together. Um, but I love the story, and uh, I wish I could remember what it is. Um, and after that, <laughs> um, after that is another bi bibliophile mystery, and I don't even want to tell you what it's about. Don't. Your editor will be mad. I know, because so, I haven't even told her what it's about. So, so stop so. right there. Just but There's, it's there's really, another one in the works. But Jen and I know, and it's amazing. It's going to be yeah. great, I think. Very good, very good. Very good, very good, very exciting. We've been, we spent, uh, we, we actually got giddy about it, because we yeah. spent, like, most of yesterday plotting it. Yeah. Boom! <laughs> Lots of murder. Um, and then, uh, for me, it's, uh, ooh! Sorry. <laughs> I try so hard to be cool. <laughs> and then it just... <laughs> I have Derek and Brooklyn in the first chapter of my next book, um, which comes out in February, and it's Fatal First Edition. And my two characters, Lindsay and Sully, are at a conference in Chicago where Brooklyn is presenting. And I tortured her for like a year ago. I'm going to kill him off. I'm going to kill him off. <laughs> So now you have to buy the book to find out if I kill off Brooks and Derek. <laughs> but I love it because it's it was uh, it was so much fun because it's on a train. A lot of it takes place on a train from Chicago to and I of course I made up all these fictional stops and yada yada. But I grew up in Connecticut and I used to take the train from New Haven to New York. And then my mom shot, you know, 80s kids. Remember the whole funny thing that they're like, oh, we drank out of the hose. We only had to be home for dinner. Yeah. My mom would put us at the train depot. We would take it to Boston. We were like 16 and we'd walk around Boston for a late day and then catch the late train back. No cell phones, nothing, nothing. Those were the best times, too. Um, so many shenanigans. But anyway, so a lot of it set on a train, which was fun for me because so much of my childhood was spent on trades, you know. Um, beta, so that was Fatal First Edition, February. And then, ooh, my Irish book, the next rom-com comes out in May. And that one is called Love at First Book. And I love that cover so much, so much. Um, but the librarian in Martha's Vineyard, who is a character in summer reading, goes to work at a bookshop in Ireland and also is working for her like favorite author, the author that kept her from a deep, deep, dark psychological hole as a teenager. And um, anyway, I won't tell you anymore, but I really love that book. And I had a, a very dear um, friend. She's my friend now. She's my nephew's, one of my nephew's best friends, but she's Irish, like she went to Trinity. And I made her read it, and she sent me all this list of, they don't say that. <laughs> you kind of swerved into Scotland there, and I'm like, damn it. <laughs> so just so you know, it's been vetted. <laughs> 
And um, a large portion of it, the main character is learning how to drive around Ireland. And I actually did that. I drove for like a week around the Ring of Kerry with my mom as a hostage, my college roommate, <laughs> and um, her daughter, who their nicknames are now the historian, my mother, uh, the medic, my college roommate, who um, did a lot of me medical rescuing during this trip. <clears throat> um, whiskey flows, I'm just going to say. And then the navigator, which was the young gun in the back seat with her phone telling me how to navigate roundabouts. So, yes, oh my God. Without her, we all would have died. But anyway, um, <laughs> and there is some video of somebody screaming in the back seat. I'm just saying. <laughs> I will share closer to the book release. But anyway, so that one comes out in May. I'm super, super excited about it. It was so much fun. Um, and then. Uh, I always get the title wrong because I have Fatal First Edition, so then I keep calling it Fatal Fondant, but it's Fondant Fumble because it's football. And they changed the release date, so I don't really know when that one's coming out. I know it, it was July, and I think it's June, but maybe not. I don't know. And then after that, yeah, that, John will find out. <laughs> right, John? But the cover's really cool, football. And then after that one in June or July, um, I have the next uh, Library Lovers. And it's the first really official Christmas one, so we will be doing this again. And it comes out in October, and it's called A Merry Little Murder Plot. So, that's it. And before we open it to questions from the audience, you can pre-order each of these authors' upcoming books. I would encourage you to do that because that helps them show to their publisher there's demand and the series continues. So if you're interested, it's never too, well, sometimes it's too early, but right now you can <laughs> order most of their books. I don't know about the fondant one. I'll have to check into that. that. Now we'll take any questions from the audience. Okay. So that way people can take pictures and send them or, or her husband Chris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? You all just want to go to the sweater portion of the contest. Well, and, <laughs> well, and I have a different publisher, not that that matters, because everybody would have, the, these two have a, one publisher and I have a different publisher, and it really doesn't matter. We would have been fine with it, but that makes it, we were kind of like, mm, I don't know. Well, yeah. Every day. Um, well, there's just a time where it seemed like they were cozy for ending, but we had to punch it a little. So I, I didn't want to leave anything hanging. So I have one library lover book called Death Meets Cat. And I got all the cupcake pictures. I mean, no, the entire cat. And I wrote another series of like catch up things. Like I have like four seasons to have the entire ensemble cast be themselves. And, but not take over the mystery, but also it was no, no, never again. <laughs> I did do it, but oh my god, it's so hard. It's so hard. We should do it. Yeah, because my girls did. I didn't know. 
Yeah. Yeah, Scotland's a big thing. Oh, we've got work this weekend now. <laughs> Any other questions? Spite. But also, you know, like, like I, when I was saying before, the cupcake bakery was a golden in a dark place. I got, when my dad passed away, I had all this grief I didn't want to do. I mean, I wrote that book in seven years, and it didn't really draw from Florence and Hanson. It just didn't find a home. But it just sat there, and then after I started writing rom coms, I started seeing it. I got uncomfortable with it, but you know, I didn't want to give it back to him. So that was the So it's not a very personal. Oh, I didn't start writing the cap, so I did. Oh, you did the Bella? <laughs> yes, I, I, did, I did Bella as soon as Cap. I, oh, I brought all the notes oh, in. Oh, nice. You published one, I'm like, oh, she's published it. <laughs> <laughs> so like, nice. It helps at the same time, though. Yeah. When I was late reading, I knew that you were reading. Oh, yeah. For those of kids, uh, Amazon has a thing called Kindle Bella, and that was kind of when I was revamping it. That was I needed a, a structure. So I had this whole book written, but you can drop like one chapter at a time. So I would go in and revisit it. So that's what I wrote to you. And I would, you know, update it on it and you know, go Bella. And they just drop a chapter at a time. And a lot of authors like, you know, it's just so uncomfortable with the novella. Oh, we can get into the lot of the novella. Oh, cool. It's kind of, I think, for me, for authors, you try Bella. It's just really safe. It's, um, it's kind of like a research and development place if you can think of it that way like we're mad scientists because you could like if i wanted to write a why a vampire, vampire bionic <laughs> robot boy i could get there <laughs> <laughs> and i could like because the, the weird thing about it is you you drop a chapter and a lot of them are free like the first three or five or whatever are free so readers could go in and read it and then step for a second part you want to see maybe like um, but you can get all the feedback, like people can make comments, like what are you thinking? <laughs> 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 or give me more. Or, you know, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's all Question? Do you open it up? So do you read, <laughs> do you read reviews? All of um, you? Mm. That's, yeah, that's a loaded question. Oh, yeah. mm. Um, I used to read reviews. So I am not a jerk. And then one made me cry. And then, because people, I don't want to be that refreshing. No, because people, I mean, it's courage to be bored. Kids can say things that I've never had the face to say. And, you know, what? I write out of spite, but I'm not a spiteful person. Mm -hmm. You know, I would never say something mean when I tell anybody, like, about your outfit, your hair. <laughs> <laughs> she looked at Kate when she was saying that. <laughs> She prints them out, prints out the nice ones, and sends them to me. I, I'm I'm very weak and fragile, <laughs> and I'm, 
And if I read a bad review, which I have, it spoils the whole thing. I mean, it really, it, and, and it's stupid, but it's like if somebody said something mean to you, that would be on your head the whole time. There would be 500 friends who are celebrating your life. <laughs> You're wearing that. You know, would be with you for the rest of your life. So I really, and my agent told me that I should. Yeah. So it'll help you to know what you're doing better than so other people. Yeah. yeah. No, don't do it. Don't do it. I mean, <laughs> there's no balance. I mean, these are people, whether they want to be writers, whether they have to act right, maybe they don't like the behind of people. They're coming for me. <laughs> it's like, it's just not, it's stick to a balance. There are people who are professional and trained. Just like Goodreads, why would anybody go into it? Number one, Amazon Home. So how is that bad? And number two, it, the bad is a mean squad. Like, I have met, you come to any office, they all kind of shoot it. Because they gang up. I mean, they're mean. And they can also lift you up. But it's, it's not, I think people, we just live in a world where it's easier to be on top. Follow the pack. Yeah. <laughs> when my husband was leaving report, when he left, Part of what had changed from when I started, when I left, was the editors acting as well and his response, what they want me to do. And he's a music producer. Well, he's also a musician. So for him, writing about somebody performing, he knows. He knows what it takes. He knows how crazy you have to be. And he wasn't going to destroy people so that the paper could get 20 clicks or they could have a oh, heated debate about whether, you know, someone's going to get. Like he and, and that's what it's kind of become for us too. It's like people will write mean things just to get a quick income. I read some. Uh they used to bother me a lot more than they bother me now. I mean there's a lot once you've read a hundred one-star reviews, you, you do develop a little bit thicker skin. Um, but the other part of it is somebody told me. Well, two things. Harlan Coben, the writer, once said, the only person not, the only writer not getting bad reviews is an unpublished writer. So I'm, I, I am very grateful to be published. The other part of it is reviews are for readers. Reviews are for readers, not for me. So, okay, I get that. And so I do read them every once in a while, not very often, but sometimes I'll go in and I'll be like, whoo, that was interesting. <laughs> Let's not do that again for another six months. But anyway, sometimes. It's probably a good point to place to end. But before we do, the last question came from a local aspiring author soon to be published, Christina Estes. Raise your hand. Yes, Christina. Yay. She has a book coming out in March. It's not too early to reserve your copy. I believe she's doing an event here at the bookstore. It's a fabulous debut. So you'll want to get in early before. What's the title? Off the air. It's got a green cover, Kate. So you will look for it in the bookstore with the green covers. <laughs> and the second thing I need to add is I want to thank those tuning in virtually, but especially a friend of the Poison Pen, a wonderful author, Hannah Dennison, who could not be Hi, here. Hannah. She's in England. We wish her the best. I know we would love to have her back whenever she can come. So now I'm going to have Jake turn off the virtual part so you can have your god-awful ugly sweater <laughs> contest. <laughs> Um, there are prizes. There um, are prizes, so don't don't move yeah, too. The authors here. will be signing after that. We do have copies of their books up front. There are refreshments. So, Jake, are you around? Am I all by myself in the building? Hello. I guess we'll. Have... Okay, someone come turn the camera off. <laughs> oh. Okay. There we go. It's just because I want you to feel free to be yourself and you don't want that going viral. I appreciate or that. Or becoming clickbait. I appreciate that. That's right. <laughs> and thank you guys all for coming and thank you for, and there are prizes. Oh, and Kate has a special surprise for Paige. I have to go get it from the other side, so don't disappear or you'll miss it. Oh. Oh, yes.